circling around to the right a little bit. Yep. This is perfect. In Kenya's Samburu National Reserve, researchers are attempting to do something that's never been done before. We're looking at the tracking app right now, trying to figure out where everybody is. Using the power of artificial intelligence to speak to elephants in their own voice. So I think I see them, here they are. They're just coming up, it's one, two, three, four. They're on the move right now. Hopefully we'll get lucky today. <laughs> AI has already cracked the code of human language. Now, it's being used to find new patterns of meaning in the sounds of the natural world all around us. All right, so it's all connected. I have a recording of an elephant, and we're gonna play back the call, and the elephant should respond. Digital acoustics combined with machine learning will allow us to hear nature in ways that something like the telescope allowed us to see further into the stars. This looks like a good spot behind those bushes. Oh, wow. The goal would be to create something like a Google Translate for non-human languages. It's a breakthrough that could change everything we think about the natural world and how us humans fit into it. It's opening up many new doors to understand the non-human world and maybe our claims to human exceptionalism, the claim that humans alone possess language, now seem a little more dubious. The stakes couldn't be higher. Scientists are racing to decode the complex communications of species already threatened by human development and climate change. I think the question really is, can we be quick enough with this? The voices of nature hang in the balance on a planet humming with the sounds of life. You ready? This story of animals and language is one that will take me all over the world. To places where artificial intelligence is driving new discoveries in the communications of other species. But where to begin? Down this icy road in central Vermont is the home of biologist and environmentalist Roger Payne pioneer in the field of animal communication. Back in the early 1970s, he showed the world that whales can sing. He's now 88 years old and battling cancer. Roger, I brought something from my childhood that was oh my god very oh. influential in my life oh wonderful i think yes. i was seven or eight when i would play that roger's best-selling album the songs of the humpback whale inspired the save the whales movement and eventually a global ban on commercial whaling at a time when the world was killing more than a hundred thousand whales a year I think it had an amazing impact on loads and loads of people just because I keep getting letters from total strangers, no idea who the hell they are. Still? Oh, yes. And now that, you know, the word has crept out that I am, in fact, dying, I get, oh, far more. I mean, just, it's amazing. And uh, what it all comes down to then is that it shows you, I think, what the effect is of the sounds of these animals on the deeper feelings that people have. Listening to these songs as just a young child, I mean, it completely blew my mind and opened up this whole world that was invisible to me. That's wonderful. Should we give a listen to the, to the record? Oh yeah, you'd be delighted. It's been a while.
That's great. Yeah, hmm. what a sound. It's like it transports you to this whole other world that is so completely yeah. different from our own, but on the same planet. It's just mind blowing to me. I'm often asked, you know, why do you care what whales say? Why should anybody care what they're saying? Why should we care what all of life might be saying? And my feeling is the reason you have to care about it is because if we fail to see the importance of the complete interworking of all species, all knitted together, then we will miss an understanding of everything that's going on that really matters. I think that's important stuff. The world has changed since the analog days of Roger Payne's research on whale songs. So we're going to go down there. Down here. So just watch your step. Yossi Yovel is working to decode animal communication with AI. And it begins with a species far from humans on the evolutionary chain, but with surprisingly similar social lives. Huh. The Egyptian fruit bat. Wow. So there's thousands of bats in there. Oh my God. By using machine learning, which is basically computer algorithms that teach themselves to find patterns in data, Yossi has discovered that bat calls are much closer to human language than previously thought. So I suggest that we go in and yeah. uh, Let's go try to look. catch a few. Okay. Yeah. Inside the cave, the bats are all communicating and flying at the same time. It shows how impossible Yossi's research would be without the help of artificial intelligence. We have thousands of organizations, and they're very similar to each other, and that's where we need the machine learning. Okay, I got a one, a pregnant one. Yeah, let's go out and have a look at what we caught. Okay. She looks like a young female, so probably she's uh, one year old or maybe one and a half years mm -hmm. old. You could see the very long tongue it uses to extract nectar from, uh, from flowers. They're very calm in the hand. So it's not nearly falling asleep. I can yeah. feel her trembling. So. You see, you have something like, I mean, tens of thousands of vocalizations recorded. How does machine learning and artificial intelligence enable you to do something differently than what you were able to do before? A few years ago, you would take these recordings and then you would try to look for features. You would try to find the differences yourself, but if I play this to you, it sounds very, very similar. If I show you the sound on a screen using what we call a spectrogram, it looks very, very similar. But once we feed thousands of these vocalizations into an AI machine, we suddenly see that there are differences. By mapping out those differences using AI and decoding their context within nearly 15,000 calls, Yossi and his colleagues made a surprising discovery. These bats have unique vocalizations for fighting, mating, and jostling for perch positions. They also vary their tones depending on their relationship to the receiver, much like humans do when addressing a close family member or a stranger. So what's next with this? Can you actually talk back to the bats once you get a sense of what these vocalizations mean in the context of them? I think it, not only that we can, we, we have to. If we want to prove that what we did is meaningful, we have to at some point 
talk to the bats. Uh, and we're still thinking of how uh, to do this. That's a big challenge. How do we measure a response to the features that we think we've learned? Yossi remembers as a child trying to understand what the birds in his backyard were saying to each other when they sang. This curiosity has carried on in the work he does today, even though the goal of actually decoding the meaning of these calls is still far off. It seems like every time you make a discovery, it's opening up new questions. Mm. Are, you, are you surprised by what you don't know? I think that as a scientist, I know that I don't know much, especially when you study these very big questions such as, you know, how do animals behave? And, you know, when these bats will come out in 30 minutes, do they know where they're heading tonight? Have they decided this now or, or, now, or yesterday or an hour ago? Are they thinking of their past? Are they thinking of their, about their future? I think these are the questions that uh, we would love to ask and we're still very, very far from even you know, having the tools or, or uh, um, knowing how to do that. There's a word for how completely different the sensory experience of another species can be. Umwelt. Take the vibrational signals of the honeybee. Instead of words, these bees communicate through dance. And AI-powered robots have become a way to crack that code. So this is it. This is the, the robotic yeah. bee that you've developed. Why are you doing this? Like, what is... What is you know, driving this research for you? We want to create technologically augmented hives that is able, for example, to recruit bees to new sources of food. Or if there's a food source that we know is contaminated because the farmer just sprayed pesticides on it, we can say, hey, wait, don't. So show me how this works. The, the sole purpose of this bee robot is to perform waggle dances. If honeybees have language, the waggle dance is its foundation. Complex vibrational patterns in the dance communicate precise coordinates to other bees so they can share new sources of nectar. By using the same artificial intelligence algorithms behind self-driving cars, Tim was able to track the bees' movements in the hive and decode the dance. Now, all he has to do is plug in the coordinates and the robotic bee does the rest. Can I try it? Of course. Okay. So basically, this will be moved inside the hive, and we're not doing this because it, it'll be dark, yeah. so they can't see. The only thing that the other bees will feel and, and smell is this little plastic tube. It's 3D printed, and it has a little wing here, and all this machinery outside here uh, will not be perceivable to the bees. So you have this keypad. You can move left and right, up and down. And then, of course, you want and to then dance. The dance. And then you just push it, and then it does its thing. Okay, let me try. Let me try that. Okay, so up, down, left, right. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. And you can start the dance. Yes. So I'm basically speaking B right now. Exactly. So you're saying, if you fly out, turn almost 90 degrees from the sun, let me think, the, the sun would be there, so you are saying, fly there. Fly there. Fly there. Fly there, 200 meters, you'll find something nice. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. I mean, does this represent the first time that this interspecies communication code has been cracked? I can't tell for sure. So uh, we've, we've shown that many bees followed the robot who are flying into the communicated direction, and that sh tells us, okay, they're trying to decode the message. But then only a handful of bees is not a real proof. Mm -hmm. So I'm really confident that it is the case. But as a scientist, I, yeah. I have to, you know, say we are still cautious. 
but uh, I think the principles can be transferred to other species. Other species with completely different worlds, but with the same principles for making contact, and even taking it a step further so that the robot also learns to interact in real time. Hey, David, nice to meet you. The guppy being the perfect case study. So David and Tim, what is this experiment we're looking at? We have a robot and a fish in the tank, and the robot looks like a fish because you paint them and glue eyes on them. Actually, it was your idea to glue little teddy bear eyes on the 3D printed guppies. And the robot was trained to interact with fish. So we now really want to see whether the robotic fish can lead the live fish from a starting area into the goal area. So this is basically the proving ground for is the robot speaking guppy? Yeah, but deeper down we are looking at the question of did we simulate the fish correctly? We have to tell the computer how the fish moves. So we have a camera looking down into the tank and we have a second camera which tracks the robot. So we know exactly where the robot is, we know exactly where the fish is, and so we can feed back that information to the robot control software. The computer evaluates the images and the robot receives command packages via Wi-Fi 20 times per second. So there's a lot of computation going on and everything has to be running in real time. So whatever the fish do may be taken as a feature for the next action of the robot. Is it working? It's working, it's working. You can see it kind of going to the robot now, right? Where it's like, oh, you're a friend. It's not like humans can just go out and start speaking to other species. Technology is going to be the key to just any progress that happens with decoding. You have to have an interface into this world. These AI-controlled robots open a portal into the worlds of other species, playing a critical role in decoding animal communication by enabling machine learning, not humans, to identify meaning from the data eliminating any chance of applying our own human assumptions to the very different sensory experience of animals. The model helps us to free ourselves from this bias that we have, the human bias, because we can't do it ourselves. In Kenya, behavioral ecologist Mickey Pardo has taken first contact to a new level. He's using a giant speaker to play what he suspects are unique names elephants use to call out to each other. Yeah, we should be ready to go. If the elephants respond to the calls specifically addressed to them, it means the calls could be actual names, a major stepping stone in learning just how complex elephant communication is. You ready? But science isn't always dramatic. Doesn't look like much of a reaction. The lackluster response is all part of the experiment. By design, Mickey won't be sure which calls were specifically addressed to the elephant until he crunches his data, eliminating any chance of human bias in his observations. 
So we're just going to keep looking and see if we can find some females? Yeah, we'll just drive uh, along the river and see. If, yeah. So the search continues. Yeah. None of this research would have been possible without artificial intelligence. I guess let's, let's just wait somewhere where we can hopefully see if she's crossing. Mickey spent months recording elephants with a special wide-frequency microphone that can detect sounds inaudible to the human ear. It's frustrating when she's right there, but we can't do anything because we don't have a clean line of sight to her. He then trained a machine learning algorithm to recognize patterns embedded in the vocalizations as a way to test whether the calls are unique depending on which elephant they were addressed to. Do you think she's going to cross the river? Most likely. Maybe we can catch her resting there mm -hmm. and do a playback. Mm -hmm. Let's go take a look. That's a good, this is a good place a good, to sit and wait for her. Yeah, that's a good spot. Yeah. These playbacks are the acid test to see if the elephants detect any meaning in the calls singled out by the AI algorithm. And if these calls are names for individual elephants, then the elephant should respond. Ready? She's going to move soon. Okay, I'm playing it. That's a very strong response. You see that darkness on her temples? Uh, That's her temporal glands streaming, which happens when they're excited about oh, something. Oh, so she yeah. reacted with her mm -hmm. temporal glands yeah. streaming? Oh my god. I mean, that was so amazing. I mean, this is as close as you can get to speaking to an elephant. Exactly, yeah. It's a little hard to interpret this until the experiment is all over, but what essentially we just did is we just called out her name in the voice of one of her family members. And then she responded to that, thinking that it was her family member calling to her. Unbelievable. <laughs> so if elephants have names for each member of the herd, potentially, I mean, does that open up a lot more possibilities as far as decoding meaning within their vocalizations? Yeah, I think it opens up all sorts of intriguing possibilities. For example, if they have calls that are specific to individual members of their family, like names, do they just use that to address one another? Or could they potentially talk about one another in the third person, so to speak? Or if they have names for each other, do they have names for other things? Do they have calls that are learned calls that are specific to different things in their environment? So I think it's certainly possible that if we discover more and more of these features that are fundamental building blocks of language in elephants or in other species, we might get to a point where we can say, maybe the boundary between language and communication is not as sharp as was once thought. Or who knows, maybe we'll discover fully fledged language in another species. I think there's just so much we don't know about animal communication, and there's so many species that have barely been studied. The question of finding language in other species inevitably raises another question. Will humans ever be able to have full-fledged conversations with animals? The one species with perhaps the most potential for that inhabits a world nothing like our own. Sperm whales have the biggest brain that we know of in the universe. This is possibly one of the most intelligent creatures that has ever existed. Marine biologist David Gruber will lead a group of 30 plus scientists here at Harvard, as well as MIT and 13 other institutions on a moonshot-like mission to decode the language of sperm whales. It's called Project SETI. Why did you choose sperm whales for this project? They're communicating socially with clicks called codas, and they're also really good for machine learning. A click is like a one and a zero. 
gather enough of those ones and zeros and the powerful AI models used for translating human languages can take a stab at finding meaning in the whale's language. Machine learning can detect patterns in 250 dimensions. If you take large amounts of one language and large amounts of another language, you could translate between them basically by seeing where the words sit next to each other. Imagine a galaxy of stars. Only in this one, each star represents a word in the English language. And where they are in space depends on how the words relate to each other. The distance between the word man and king, for instance, is the same as the distance between woman and queen or girl and princess. By representing language geometrically like this, it can be broken down into a kind of math for words. And something remarkable was discovered by doing this. It turns out the shape of the English language universe, or latent space as it's called, is the same shape as every other human language. I mean, you can actually lay the shape of one language on top of another and, and get a direct translation, right? Exactly. But I mean, the real question that we have is how much of this translates to another animal's language? In other words, would the multidimensional universe of dots representing human language match up with the shape of another species' language enough to get a translation? It's a mind-blowing thought, but Gruber says the question he gets the most is not what the whale would say, it's what would he say back? And I always say, well, it's more the fact that we're listening and we want to know what the whale's saying. That's important, but that's not satisfying to most people. They were like, come on, what would you really want to say? And I said, well, what would you want to say to the whale? And one of the responses that I hear often is, I'm sorry. It makes me wonder what I would say if I could speak to a whale, or to an elephant, or a bat. This thought has haunted me since I spoke with David back in Cambridge. If AI succeeds and actually enables something like a Google Translate for the animal world, who's making the rules for how it's used? It's a question I posed to professor and author Karen Bucker. So this use of digital technology is risky from an ethical perspective. Karen's book, The Sounds of Life, explores humanity's relationship with nature in the digital age. It would be all too easy to misuse some of these technologies for precision hunting or precision fishing, to manipulate or exploit species we've already domesticated, or perhaps even some would try to use this to domesticate species we have not yet previously domesticated. Without ethical guardrails in place, she says those risks are very real. But there is another way. Western science is kind of playing catch up and rediscovering some things that indigenous communities have long known. Relationships between indigenous communities and their non-human kin are very deep and rich. And that's why it's so important to make sure that those indigenous ethical guardrails are incorporated into some of this science, without which I am concerned that some of these technologies could be misused. In northern Kenya's Indoto Mountains, the Dorobo tribe has lived for millennia as hunter-gatherers. Their survival sustained by a deep connection to this land and to a small wild bird called the Greater Honey Guide. A bird they can talk to. Yeah. I set out at dawn with two Jorobo guides to search for this mystical bird. The Dorobo say the honey guides and humans could talk to each other 
since the beginning of time. The Dorobo's call to the honey guide has been passed down from generation to generation. A call the honey guide knows to listen for. This unlikely partnership between man and bird is one of the only documented cases of humans and wild animals cooperating to seek out food. Honey guides lead the men to wild beehives in exchange for a share of the wax and calorie-rich larvae. In the drought, the search takes longer. The bees have been scarce, which means both the honey guides and the Dorobo are hungry. And then it happens. We found the bees. So the honey guide guided us. We followed it and guided us right to the sheep. It's amazing. <laughs> it's like shining a flashlight into the hole. Fire is the tool the honey guide lacks. 
Evidence this relationship extends back to our earliest ancestors, who first mastered the use of fire nearly two million years ago. The smoke is used to calm the bees before the harvest. For the honey guides, their stings would be lethal. So they've cut away the opening of the hive. This relationship between the Dorobo and the honey guides is built on mutual trust and deep time. So good. <laughs> the honey guides return as we finish to eat the wax we've left behind, their reward for guiding the way. It's this kind of ethical code, this mutual dependence on the natural world, that today's light speed progress in decoding animal communication with AI lacks. But even this ancient partnership between the Dorobo and the wild honey guides is threatened. <laughs> Time is running out for the Dorobo honey gatherers, just as it is for the rest of the planet. So maybe AI, both its potential to reconnect us to the natural world and the speed in which it can do it, is something we need now more than ever in spite of the risks. From the air, it's clear that climate change, drought, and cattle are ravaging the land Kenya's wildlife depends on for survival. I mean, what's amazing or what I'm seeing is I'm looking down and you're, I'm just seeing bare earth. It's really intense. The last truly wild animals and the biodiversity they support are in trouble. In the past few years, the trend toward environmental collapse has accelerated. This landscape tells the story of a natural world forced to compete for increasingly limited resources. It makes me question, what would these animals say to us humans if we could understand them? And would such a breakthrough be enough of a catalyst to change how humanity lives on this planet? The only precedent history has to offer is Roger Payne's whale songs. Given how much the world has changed since this came out and people rallied around this, what do you take away from it? How does it feel to you? I guess I felt that is what should have happened. The enthusiasm was just shocking. That enthusiasm truly launched an environmental revolution around saving the whales. And Roger says he's hopeful that if humans could understand what animals were saying to each other, the world could be moved enough, again, to halt our runaway destruction of nature. One of Roger's favorite quotes is from Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, the author of The Little Prince. If you want to build a ship, it reads, Don't drum up the men to gather wood, divide up the work, 
and give orders. Instead, teach them to yearn for the vast and endless sea. Something I truly understand because I spend a lot of time here yearning. It's a reminder that using artificial intelligence to decode the communications of other species, as mind-blowing and beautiful as that would be, it's nothing compared to people's deep attachment to place and the ability to listen, unmediated, to the chorus of nature. Without that, I wonder if we'll ever truly understand what these animals are saying to each other and potentially to us humans. <laughs>